thank you very much for being with us. We're here to talk about gatekeepers. And although it's called gatekeepers, in many cases, um, the people who are here are actually people who open gates and open those gates wide. And we're going to talk about how that happens and why that happens, the opportunities when that happens, and the challenges presented when you're trying to do that kind of work. When the ranks of a cultural institution or a, can, a creative field tend to be very homogenous, you have a special responsibility if you're working in a particular field and you have a special opportunity. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and I have a wonderful panel to do this. I have moderated many panels, no disrespect to anyone who has been on any of the panels that I've been on this week. But this is the panel. <laughs> this is the panel I've been waiting for all week. Um, to my right is Franklin Leonard. He's a former Universal Pictures executive who's also the founder of The Blacklist. How many of you know about The Blacklist? Wait every December um, for The Blacklist to come out. If you don't, it is an annual survey of some of Hollywood's best-liked screenplays. It's the second Friday in December. Do I have that correct? Uh, it's the last Monday before everyone goes oh, on the Monday. Vacation. Okay, so, so it just it's... depends on when everybody decides to cut out and we drop it right before they leave. Okay, so it's in December every year when a lot of people are focused on Christmas shopping and all kinds of holiday shopping. Boom, this drops and everyone pays attention. And you've been doing this since 2004? Five. Five, okay, 2005, wanted to make sure I got that right. So that's Franklin Letter. glad you're with us. <laughs> Thelma Golden is the director and chief curator for the Studio Museum in Harlem, a place that is much beloved, not just in Harlem, but around the world, often just called the studio. Before she um, joined the studio, she worked um, at the Whitney, and she was largely responsible for helping to put together the 1993 Whitney Biennial, which is thought of by many as the beginning of the modern art world, um, as we understand it today. And she was also, uh, she was also behind uh, several exhibitions, such as Black Male Representations of Masculinity in Contemporary American Art. Um, we are so glad that you were with us, Thelma. Thank you very, very much. And all the way um, to my left is Chris Jackson. He is the executive editor at One World Imprint at Random House, um, an imprint that he's recently taken over. We are, we are not just applauding him for his work, but also passing on congratulations to this new gig and this new position. We are very excited about this. You've seen his handiwork in books published by ta Coates, by Brian Stevenson, by Jay-Z. Um, a recent profile of, um, <laughs> of Chris in the New York Times Magazine noted this and I'm just gonna quote if I can. To the extent that 21st century literary audiences have been introduced and to the realities and the absurdities born of the phenomenon of race in America, Jackson has done a disproportionate amount of that introducing. So thank you very much for being with us also. Um, I want to begin by asking each of you how you see your role as a, gatekeep a gatekeeper or as someone who can throw open the gates in your particular field. Let's begin with you, Chris. Um, okay, uh, so, you know, publishers are, are I think, um, in, in a lot of ways resented for their, the role that they um, are presumed to play in gatekeeping because people, there's so many people who write and so few of them get published. Um, so I think there's like always been like a sort of general um, you know, I used to go to, to, literary, to literary conferences and things like that and meet unpublished writers, and there's always kind of a seething hatred of editors because I always thought, you're the one who's stopping me from getting published. Um, but in my role at, uh, at Random House, I've always thought of, of my job as being sort of to widen the kind of channels of what gets published. Um, and ha not just what gets published, but how it gets published and how we think about the books we publish and how we think in even bigger ways about literary culture and about the culture within organizations that, um, that are cultural organizations that have that responsibility. Um, I think, you know, there's, uh, there's been a lot of talk recently about this idea of, uh, of pandering in, in literature in particular. Um, and there's this writer, Marlon James, who won the Booker Prize uh, last year, and he wrote a piece about how, you know, there's all these books that he wrote in his mind that were never, that he never submitted to anyone because he has this person in his mind, this, the gatekeeper figure, who for him is this uh, sort of a, a middle brow white woman. Like he's got this sort of generic middle brow white woman in his head who um, is the one who decides what gets published. And um, Is he wrong about that? And he's right about that to some degree <laughs> because uh, 
you know, his first novel was rejected, like famously, like dozens yeah. and dozens, like everyone rejected his first novel, and it was published by an independent press, Akashic. And this is someone who last year won the prize for the best work in the English language <laughs> around the world, right? But could not get published um, initially until this independent publisher kind of provided a wedge for him to get published um, by mainstream publishers and kind of prove his worth. Um, so I think that there is a, there's a, the gatekeeping function in publishing is actually somewhat perverse and has been historically perverse and has stopped. Um, you know, I feel like there are all these wonderful ideas that are, that, you know, when I go out and I meet writers and journalists and thinkers and doers who are doing interesting things, writing interesting things, and I think about audiences, you know, when you go and you meet people who are readers and people who are interested in those things, and then both of those are these expansive worlds. And in between, <laughs> there's this very narrow um, doorway uh, that these big ideas uh, need to get to like the biggest audiences. And that doorway is unfortunately very narrow, which is in some ways an opportunity for someone who wants to you know, widen that because there's so much uh, great material out there. And I could go on and on about it, but there, it's, it's, um, there's definitely you know, a lot of truth to the idea that there is a, constrict, a constricting force you know, in literary culture. Um, but I think that's also, there's an opportunity to, to widen that. I'm going to uh, come back to this, but one just a qu question. Yes. Has, that, has that changed over time, particularly with the success of the books, several of the books that you yourself have had a hand in? Is that starting, you know, what you're describing is almost like a lock system in a, in a dam. Right, exactly. And, and is that starting to widen a little bit because of the success of those books that found audience? Right, yeah, I do think that what happens is when a book is successful, uh, I mean, this is something else that's very true of the publishing industry. There's a... A, a desire to just do something derivative, <laughs> like immediately afterwards. Like once an audience has been identified, people want to like feed that audience. But this is the thing, um, and I was talking about this earlier actually with uh, with Sarah Lewis. Um, when you have a disparity between uh, between the people who work within these organizations and um, and like you know, for instance, in book publishing, I think one percent or two percent of the people in book publishing are African Americans. Can you so just say that again? Because we need to, we didn't make sure that people absorb that I think it might be statistic. 2% now. <laughs> um, when it comes to editorial or executive positions, it's, I think, 2%, um, which is incredible. And this is in New York City, which, you know, has more than 2%, uh, and not to mention a country that has, like, you know, 15% African American population. Anyway, um, so you have, like, a very small number of African Americans who are in these organizations, right? So you have a book like Tom Hasse's book, which is hugely successful, wins the National Book Award, sells hundreds and hundreds of thousands of copies, um, and it's been on the bestseller list for almost a full year now, um, uninterrupted. Uh, and people think, well, we need to do more of that, all right? But because you don't have people within those organizations who understand even what that was, you end up with something that is like, okay, we need to do something like Tom Hasse, so let's find another person who kind of fits, you know, sort of superficial characteristics of what he's doing and publish that instead of thinking, we need to open our minds to what this readership might be open to, right? We need to think differently about how to find writers and how to cultivate writers and how to address audiences. Um, and instead, it's sort of this kind of like, let's duplicate what we've seen work, which, you know, in some ways does widen the, uh, the you know, the imaginations to some degree of, you know, what can be published. But, um, but I think without having people in the buildings who really understand you know, those successes, it, it's, uh, it, it doesn't lead, I think, to new thinking, which I think is the key. Thank you. Thumb, how do you see your role? Yeah, you know, I, I have to go back to talk about this to my time at the Whitney, um, okay. when I became a curator there in the early 90s. And because I was raised kind of, you know, in a combination of sort of, you know, African-American uplift culture and sort of seven sisters, you know, go yeah. get it, do it, that combination you made You went it to school at Smith. Smith. Um, Yay, Smith. <laughs> um, so what that really created in me in going to the Whitney was that I had been made to believe, right, in this idea of how power existed in this bastion of the art world, mm -hmm. right? And again, um, you know, to Marlon's idea, it wasn't one middle-aged, middle-brow white woman, but it was a room of people who sat around the table and decided which artists would get in and which artists would get out, and that it was that methodical. And so when I got to the Whitney as a curator, after having worked as a curatorial assistant at both the Studio Museum and the Whitney, what I understood was that, that yes, there was a lot of power in this role, but I really made a conscious decision that 
I was not going to be a gatekeeper as much as I was going to understand how to galvanize mm -hmm. that power. Mm -hmm. So I literally, you know, the Whitney at that time was in the Marcel Breuer building on 75th Street and Madison Avenue. That's now the Metropolitan Museum, the Met Breuer. So it's, it's confusing because when I say the Whitney, whatever. Okay, so in that building, the architecture has a moat. And when you walk in the front door, you walk under that moat. And every single day, when I walked through that door, I would say, what am I going to do for black artists today? Mm -hmm. Literally. You would, li you would say it out loud. Out loud. <laughs> oh, okay. Out loud. Out loud. What am I going to do for black artists today? And when I walked out of that building every day, I would say, what did I do for black artists mm -hmm. today? Because I knew quite literally that the weight of possibility for change really rested in my understanding what the role was, what my possibility was in the role, what the opportunity was, but really most importantly, what the responsibility had to be. So I really thought of sort of understanding, you know, what it meant to be a gatekeeper, how that had been used, right, against the possibility of change, <laughs> and how I would use that very same platform to an end that I thought was to the great benefit, not simply of those specific artists I could work with, but black artists generally. I also think it has something to do with sort of understanding both the public work, right? I was a curator, so many people felt the public work manifests in exhibitions. And I was super proud of every exhibition I made, but for me, that was really only 10% of the work. Because the work, the advocacy work, was not just what would end up on the walls, mm -hmm. but it was the work that I would do to see the possibility of creating real allies and accomplices in this larger dialogue that created more space mm -hmm. for more black artists and for more possibilities for them that wasn't just in my own work, but that could happen in the work of my colleagues and others who weren't even in the institution. So can I ask you about the biennial? Yes. If, if you ever saw it, it, it never leaves you. Okay. And when you're talking about the, um, the entrance to the building, yeah. I'm thinking of the, the installation mm -hmm. in the, it, when you walked in. The Pat Ward Williams, what you look at? Yes, the, mm -hmm. yeah, and the, the picture, and there yeah. are three, and they look tough. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I mean, they have this, this sort of hard mm -hmm. look on their face. Mm -hmm. and, and in big letters, what you looking at? Right. Right, so in, you, in the window of the Whitney Museum on Madison Avenue, literally where the bus stopped. So everyone on the bus would see that. Yes, very intentional. Mm -hmm. When you put that together, did mm -hmm. you know that it would have lasting impact? Were you trying to not just change the real estate that you occupied, but send a message to the larger world? Um, yes and no. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, I was... 26, 27 years old when the 93 Biennial happened. Mm -hmm. It was my first major exhibition and it was Whitney Biennial. So just you know, put that yeah. in context. Um, so no, I knew nothing in that regard. However, I did know that that biennial having more artists of color than any biennial had ever had, that biennial getting more bad press than any biennial had ever gotten, which is saying a lot because every Whitney biennial gets <laughs> a level of critique. So to imagine that to then say you got the most, you know, sort of a very interesting. Um, so I didn't. What I did know was that this was space that had to be opened up. Right? And in some ways, literally putting the Pat Ward Williams outside of the building was a way to do that. That was the biennial that also had Danny Martinez's entrance buttons yes. that said, I could never imagine wanting to be white, right. that everyone had to wear. You know, there were many works in that exhibition that really were also signaling not simply what the biennial was about, but the space of debate at that moment mm -hmm. in multiculturalism. You talked about AIDS, art. you talked about poverty. It you was talked all about there. You know, fast forward, it's, it's hard to think about that now because the space that it created, now certain of those things are a norm, right, in the art world. But at the moment, I certainly felt it was necessary and possible to think about what that exhibition could do. And working with my colleagues, Lisa Phillips, Elizabeth Sussman, and John Hanhart, mm -hmm. we definitely, you know, we're working very intentionally to create something with that exhibition and to have it have a dialogue that would last well beyond the two years until the next one happened. And it but, did, in fact. Franklin. Yes. How do you see your role? Um, it evolves constantly, but I think I see my role principally as adjusting the economic circumstances of the film industry so that if you have talent, you have an opportunity to tell stories in, in, economic, in a sort of economic resource intensive art form. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, historically, uh, if you want to work in Hollywood, you, the advice you get if you talk to anybody is, if I want to be a writer, well then you need to move to LA and take a bad job and maybe, you know, network yourself silly until someone pays attention to your script. And that's great if you are an upper middle class kid and like mommy and daddy can pay for your BMW and you can sort of, you know, 
drive around and write, and maybe you'll meet somebody at a party. Um, but if you're not that, if you are a single mother from the south side of Chicago or you know, a suburban dad in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, that's terrible advice, and you can't do it. Um, like you are, a, you are a, an absent parent if you sort of tread to Hollywood to, to make your way as a screenwriter. And so, but, it, but the ability to do that is not at all coincidental with your ability to write well. In fact, I would argue that it's, it's inversely uh, connected. Um, I, would, I would read a script from someone who is living a life of not ease over someone who is living a life of ease any day of the week. Um, so you know, we're trying to build an infrastructure that allows anybody who is writing scripts and doing it well to have their material evaluated by uh, people who might be predisposed to like it if it's good, and then make the industry aware of that. And I think by putting our sort of thumb on the scales that way, uh, it has you know a ripple effect that has the potential to result in an in increased diversity of content. Um, that's the product of a meritocracy. I mean, my, my claim has always been that if you if you had a true meritocracy in Hollywood, you would see a lot more diversity than exists mm -hmm. now. Uh, the failure of Hollywood's diversity is a failure of meritocracy. Um, because unless you somehow believe that like men are 10 times better directors than women are, uh, there's no other explanation for the numbers that you see in except for the fact that there is a strong anti-meritocratic advantage provided towards young white men. Um, and I think we need to acknowledge that first and foremost. And I, we do a lot of work about confronting that reality. Um, but then give people who are not young white men uh, an opportunity to succeed uh, alongside people who may happen to be young white men. Um, but they should be on equal footing. And I think when you, when you see equal footing, you see a lot of diversity. Go figure. Help us understand how the blacklist works. You have yeah. nominators. Yeah, so there's, there's really two major components to it. There's an annual survey um, where we survey every executive at every major studio, uh, major film financier, and production company who have deals there with, um, which is roughly 600 people. Um, and, that, and we ask them to send us a list of their 10 favorite screenplays from that calendar year uh, that won't have been produced by the end of the year. And we just sort of aggregate so that information. principal photography cannot have started. Principal photography year. cannot have started by December 31st of that calendar year. Um, and then we combine all those votes and just put the list out. Like literally most votes at the top, least votes at the bottom. I think you have to have seven min votes minimum in order to, to succeed. Mm -hmm. And that has been, that's more of a mirror, right? That sort of shows the industry, here's what you're reading and here's what you're liking. Is the, are the nominators, are the circle of nominators diverse? Um, the, the circle of nominators are who is working in Hollywood. So they are on that average say, not diverse. Yeah. Uh, no, I, gender-wise, I'd say there it's roughly 50-50. Racially, it is not a, it, it, it is a, it is a voting body that does not look like America. Um, so, and and that is reflected in the scripts that are often on the list. You know, I've been proud of the fact that we're seeing increased gender diversity on the list, which I think is a product of, of a number of different shifts that are taking place in the industry. Um, but there have not been a lot of people of color on the list. And again, I think that reflects barriers uh, both outside of and inside the industry to entry. So is that frustrating for you? You, you create the list and the list comes back and there aren't enough women, there aren't enough people of color, there aren't enough people who come from Winston-Salem, Winston right. North Carolina. Well, it is frustrating, but, but there's a fun sort of consequence of that. Having built this annual list, it gave me a platform to then do the things that I want to do and sort of direct uh, things the way I wanted to direct them. So it, we have the annual survey. That became a thing very quickly in 2006. Um, we've done it every year for the last 11 years. And you know, half of the last eight best pictures came from that list. The Revenant was on the, the list. The Revenant was on that list. Nine of the last 18 screenwriting Oscars came from that list. A Spotlight was on that list. The Imitation Game, Slumdog Millionaire, Argo, et cetera. Um, then we built a website. And we said, anybody on Earth can upload their English language screenplay. They can pay to have it evaluated. Um, and if it's good, we would tell the entire industry. And what we found overwhelmingly is that um, the folks whose work we're discovering via that entry point is far more diverse than Hollywood. So I got your attention over here, and now I'm going to ask you to look over here. Exactly. And because of how successful we were over here, you'd be an idiot not to pay attention to right. us over here. Right. And, and I think what's, really, and what's been amazing about that even more so is the fact that um, we're not, there's no like, affirmative action happening. Our readers are reading scripts blind. Mm -hmm. They don't know, and we, and we allow writers to submit under pen names. So if you have a distinctly female ethnic name, you can be John Smith in the context of our marketplace. Mm -hmm. And what's amazing is, is that we started collecting demographic data last year. And I, you know, I, I think about these issues constantly, and I was worried. You know, our, our readership, our paid readers on the site 
are more diverse than Hollywood, but less diverse than America. Mm -hmm. And that's a consequence of honestly, like we look for readers, but we're pulling from people who have experience doing that professionally. Um, and so there's only so many people available, by the way, period, white, black, or otherwise, at the level that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to make sure that there was no demographic bias in the ratings that our readers were receiving. And what we found really interestingly was that if you look at the distributions by demographic, by age, by race, and by gender, there was virtually no difference in the distribution of scores. Just to say the talent, again, shockingly, evenly distributed. There, there's, no, there's no sort of genetic connection between gender, race, and talent. So this is an interesting form of accountability that worked well in Hollywood. Would something like this work in the publishing industry or in the museum space? There's actually one thing I'd love to add to that. Mm -hmm. There was one difference. Um, women, on average, tended to submit less absolute garbage than men did. <laughs> Are we Which, surprised no, by that? We're not. We're not at all. But I think it, but I think it bears like we, we have like concrete quantitative evidence that if you look at the distribution of scores. Men are, is, a, is a near perfect bell curve. Women begins like a bell curve, and then sort of right where like mediocrity begins, just drops. Mm -hmm. So women, and I, I've, I had this experience in my own life. You know, we, I know guys who will finish, you know, fade out, print. Where's my million dollars? Mm -hmm. And women, who I, I script people who I've read, and I'm re I, I'm aggressively hassling them for me to share their work with agents and managers. Look. I'm not perfectly happy with the end of the second act. Let me figure that out, and then I'm happy to have you send it. Um, and and like we, have co we have quantitative evidence of that now. And it was, it was funny when the numbers came back, looking at them, I was like, oh, yeah, not surprising, but amazing how like, in stark numerical relief, there it is. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Thank you for adding that. Yeah. So the question, would, would something like this, could you, could you imagine something like this in your space, Thelma? I'm, I'm not sure, just because the terms of the way in which one encounters art mm -hmm. yep. and need yeah. to think about art and read it visually are different. What I think is the same, however, for those of us, for example, in the art world who participate, participate in blind juries of artwork, is this idea that they tend to be, they surface much more diversity than what we would see on the other side of the numbers of artists of color, say, in group exhibitions mm -hmm. right, around the country. So I think the same principle applies. The talent is out there. It's just this opportunity to get into whatever we consider that move towards what the legitimate space of being you know, in the art world, in the museum world means that is really where the barrier comes. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure what the equivalent system mm -hmm. could or would be that would apply. But I think what Franklin has done, though, however, gives a lot of weight to this idea that those of us who are looking and seeing and arguing for the idea that there is all this talent and we know that it's out there, that the opportunity to begin to question the modes of how things are selected, how they're picked, and how we end up seeing what we see becomes very important in mm -hmm. the work itself. Mm -hmm. Chris, yeah, and, and if mm -hmm. I could just add to the question also, Please. there's something intriguing about this um, that you might call a rim shot. Mm -hmm. You know, if you play pool, I mean, you, you sort of hit it over here and then you get it in the pocket right. mm -hmm. um, through a sort of complicated path. Um, are you intrigued at all by that notion of, in, in, the, mm -hmm. in the work that he's doing mm -hmm. here? So I would say two things. One is I think that in uh, when it comes to writing and literature, I think there are it's become sort of wildly democratized over the last several years because of you know what's happening digitally. There's so many writers who have found forums and platforms to kind of uh, get their voices out there, and I think that's been um, that's been an incredible resource. I think for people who want to go out and find those writers. So I think, uh, and I think it hasn't to some degree. I mean, when they're used to when you have to publish in a magazine before anyone would take notice of you, there were several gatekeepers you had to kind of get through before you rose to the attention of anyone. Now you have to find an audience on your own, and you can find an audience on your own, um, independent of any of those people, and you can start to develop your craft to some degree. And I think that's been actually a resource uh, for me. And I, I've been talking to a lot of writers who, uh, I mean, I spend a lot of my time like trying to find writers in addition to the things that come to me through the normal channels. And, uh, and I have been you know, finding more and more writers who are out there in the digital space <laughs> which is almost zero barrier to entry. Um, and uh, so, yes, and as far as the rim shot goes, um, yeah, I think that's absolutely true in, uh, in just going back to you know, this idea of the gatekeeper who's inside the institution. I think um, having, uh, I mean, I do think the key is finding some form of success that gives you credibility mm -hmm. so that you can then kind of expand, I think, what you're doing. I think it's hard to always be, uh, you know, trying to generate things from the ground up without having some things that actually, you know, have some uh, 
some uh, greater chance of success, you know, but still within the same space. Um, so yeah, so for instance, I do a book with someone like Jay-Z, that's not an uh, unheard of writer who I've like um, brought to the public's attention. Um, but what you do with a book of someone like Jay-Z is you try to, uh, uh, with, you know, using his celebrity and using his sort of fame, you try to create something that's actually kind of an interesting model for what a kind of personal narrative can be, and then find other ways to apply that, um, and get credibility for building that kind of book, and then you can, in fact, I'm working on another book right now by someone no one's heard of that in some ways uses some of the devices that we, uh, that we used with Jay-Z to, to tell the story. So. So can I just add to that? Mm -hmm. How, what role does segmentation play? Because in the book industry, there's a there there is a question. Less so now because of digit, because people find books in the digital space because mm -hmm. people are able to share books in a digital space. But where you find books and how you find books, right. you know, where you go to find books by African American authors, is often in the back of the store, um, in the corner of the store where the lighting is not as good as the rest of the store. Um, and you know, you have to, when Leaking you're moving books, ceiling, yeah. you know, there's that, that, that cherished space at the front of the bookstore where the books are on tables, where they catch your attention, where you're on the way to the cash register. And in a book, you know, in every industry, people look at metrics, people look at the bottom line. And if right. you can't find the book, it's harder to sell the book. So what, what role does segmentation play in this? Um, so as you said, it's less of an issue now than it used to be because uh, so many books are sold through, uh, not sold in physical retail spaces. Um, I, you know, I, again, I think a big part of it, and this goes back to your previous question in some ways, is having the credibility of success, and then your books stop being, and it's an interesting thing, like they stop being treated as niche books. And this is also uh, sort of at the core of what I'm trying to do, like with my new imprint as well, which is like these are not niche books that we're publishing, although we're publishing voices from across the spectrum of people from different parts of the world, people from different backgrounds, um, people with political ideas that are outside of the mainstream to some degree, people who are writing about new forms of identity and things like that. But these are not small books. Like you have to position those things as the biggest possible books. These are the books that describe reality. So they deserve to be on the front of the table. And if you have, which is great as an abstract idea, right? But then when you can you know, have some track record of success with that, I think that's when I mean, you talk about widening the kind of you know, diversity of publishing, I think that's a big part of it. It's like not just widening the kind of books, um, the number of books that you're publishing, but how they're treated. Mm -hmm. And so that people start to say, that book is, I mean, it might be about, you know, it might be the memoir of, you know, an African-American boy or whatever growing up in some corner of America, but that's a book about everything. That's a book about the most universal themes and about all of our lives and about the society we have and our values and all those things and deserves to be at the front table. So it's a through line from Tom Sawyer, you know, exactly. straight to that exactly. child's life. You have to understand, I think this is one of the roles, you know, talking about the role of the gatekeeper that you have is, uh, is that not just, you know, sort of, putting those things out in the world, but really positioning them in a way that people can see how big they are, instead of thinking of them as these sort of niche products. And I think that's something that I encourage all writers to do as well. Think about what you're saying. I mean, you have a lens, yes, a specific lens, but you can use that lens to claim everything with it. Some of this has to do, because we see this in film a lot too, mm -hmm. this notion that um, sort of whiteness is the default. Um, and that if the, the hero in a movie is, is a white man, then everyone will go see the movie, but if it's a black woman, then only black women will see the film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's, it's a failure of imagination, it's a failure of justice, but it's also a failure of economics, uh, which in Hollywood is obviously the greatest sin. Um, and I think it's only starting to dawn on Hollywood now that that's maybe not the case. That there like, are universal yeah, stories absolutely. to tell. Well, that if, that if you, can, you can make Star Wars with a female lead a, 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 you know, an, a British uh, man of African descent um, and, and a Latino, and the movie will make a billion dollars not in spite of that, but because of it. Um, like that is, a, is the dawning realization in Hollywood is that maybe it's better if you do that. Maybe if you cast your television show like Shonda Rhimes casts her television mm -hmm. show, it is more likely that more people will see your show people of color and people who are not. So a dawning color. realization, but for a long time in Hollywood there was a, there was a concern about the aftermarket, you know, the, yeah. Ulmer scale, the Ulmer scale, the suggestion that if a film featured a person of color, yeah. that the film would not do well overseas. We're about, what, 60% of the still, gross? There is still that default belief, one that we are actively fighting, um, because the, the problem with that belief is that it is conventional wisdom that is not wisdom, it is convention. So it's and, not backed up by numbers. It is backed up not at all by numbers, not at all. And, and, and furthermore, 
I actually take real offense to this because it is one of it is the the argument most often repeated as to why uh, pe people of color aren't cast in certain but roles. But this is real. I mean, but people why, have no, lost. No, I mean, Larry is, Fishburne went to took, went is, to court over this. This is this is the you you can ask any studio executive in Hollywood right now uh, why more African Americans are not cast in movies, and their their response will be, well, you can't sell it abroad. Mm -hmm. Now, you have Will Smith, Denzel Washington, Jamie Foxx. They all do pretty well mm -hmm. abroad. But let's put aside that for a moment and think about the fact that. Um, Into Sable is, I think, the number two movie of all time in France. Uh, stars Omar Sy, a, a Senegalese man. 75% um, of the French national soccer team is of African or Arab descent. I was just in Paris for the Euro Cup. You were seeing white French people streaming out of the stadium with Paul Pogba jerseys on. Um, this idea that in every other aspect of life, uh, people can consume black culture and music, that they idolize black athletes, but somehow, on screen, in a movie, they're not interested. It just, it, it just defies all rational explanation. But yet it is, again, repeated over and over and over as justification for uh, the reason why you can't diversify movie cast. So here at Aspen, there are many people who come to fill their cup with ideas and meet interesting people. And many of them are themselves gatekeepers. They, can, they play a critical role in saying yes or saying no, in opening doors, or if not closing doors, making sure the opening is just so narrow that only a few people can get through. So for people who maybe don't feel invested in this in the same way because it's not their history, it's not their people, it's not their community, arm them with information or the argument that they should make or the reason that they should lean into this. Well, I would, I would just say that, um, and I, I see this happening, and I think you make an excellent point about how it's happening across the culture, right? Like you can either participate in it or not, right? And if you don't participate in it, then you've, you've lost. And I think we're seeing increasingly, and I, I can just speak even for book publishing, I think there's certain kinds of models of book publishing which are remaining in the old conventional you know, sort of way and keeping that sort of gate nice and narrow and making sure a certain sensibility is fed over and over and over again with diminishing returns. And I think, go ahead and do that. If that's their thing, do that. But there's a whole other world out there that you're going to lose out on. What have they lost? You said you've lost. What have you lost? What is it tangible that you've lost? You've lost sales of <laughs> books. Money. Like you've literally <laughs> lost That's what money. So let's take a question here, and then I'll come over here. Okay. Uh, yeah, you guys have alluded to this, but I'm wondering if you can speak uh, a little bit more about the role that the internet plays in this conversation. Um, particular, I mean, on one hand, we see sort of a lamentation about the coarsening of the culture that is blamed on the internet. On the other. If it hasn't completely lowered the barriers to entry, it's reshaped the obstacles, um, particularly for uh, book publishing and Hollywood, where the internet is held up as sort of an existential threat. At the same time, it is a new kind of source of talent. I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about And can you tell that. us who you are and where you're from? Oh, I'm Catherine Bracey from Oakland, California. And I'm a technologist, so I'm asking about the internet. <laughs> um, I think, you know, Chris touched on this about, you know, uh, breaking down the barrier to entry. I think in the art world, what it's created is just more accessibility <coughs> for artists. You know, in some ways, the curatorial role often had you know, many people between a curator and artist. And I think technology has broken that down and actually made more of a principle of being accessible right? as a curator, having that direct relationship to the sort of wide range of possibility be possible. Yeah, and I think the other thing that has happened with uh, <coughs> it's gone <laughs> with yeah, the internet. Okay. Yeah, okay. um, I know. <laughs> with the uh, with the internet is that it's aside from finding talent in the internet, it's become a method that people can use to cultivate audience and connections with audiences for writers in particular. And I think one of the things that surfaced is these communities of readers that previously I think were people didn't know even existed and who rallied around certain writers, particularly like you know I have a writer named Eddie Wong who. I just published, I've published a couple of books with, and he first appeared, like I first found him on a blog that he had. Um, but he's also really very active in social media and has created through social media over the years, through his various explosions <laughs> on social media, um, he's created a group of people who are interested in what he has to say and then created a dialogue with those people. And it's been interesting for me to watch as his editor because I can also get a sense of like, who are, who are these people who are buying the book and who are coming to him? And it's actually built a community. And I think that's something that writers now have an opportunity to do they didn't have in the past, where they were more reliant on the publisher and the people within the building finding their readers, which was always a little bit tricky depending on who was in the building. You know? And does that lower the barrier if they come in with a following? Are you more likely to buy the book? Or 
I'm just going to repeat that so they get that. And does that lower the barrier for people who are coming in? Does that allow? Does that entice them to buy? The yeah, product? absolutely, absolutely. There's a, a few people who are whose entire like platform source of uh, of stardom, if you want to call it that, is through the internet. And they've done. I mean, you know, on one hand, there's these YouTube books, which are these people who are YouTube stars who I don't know who any of these people are, which is like, <laughs> this was my moment to acknowledge how old I was. And it's like, I don't know who these people are. But they'd have like lines of people going around the block and they were just like YouTube stars. And that's at a very kind of pop cultural level, but it's just an example of how, you know, rabid fan bases are built through social media now. It's kind of amazing to watch. Yeah, it's definitely true in film. I mean, the reduction in just the cost of making a movie. I mean, Tangerine was at Sundance and was a legitimate Oscar contender it was, made, it was shot on iPhones, like not even the new iPhone, the last iPhone. Um, so the idea that, you know, well, I, I look at it this way. What I'm really excited about is that there's a generation of kids out there that have access to the entire history of film via the internet um, in the same way that Quentin Tarantino had to work in a movie at a rental store for years to watch the same number of movies. And then they have phones in their pocket and laptops where they can shoot movies, edit them, and make them available to audiences that's, that's available to them now. Um, and so I think Hollywood's already sourcing the next great directors and the next great storytellers via the internet because they don't want somebody else to find them. But the, what's great about it is, is if they continue to ignore the people that are making great content, they'll be able to just make it and monetize it themselves, and they're not going to need Hollywood. So when people like Issa Rae show up and have a real audience, HBO's like, great, what do you want to do? Like, we'll give you, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, but in five years, Issa's not going to need HBO. Um, and I think it is an existential threat, maybe most principally to, uh, to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Question here. The gatekeeper to the gatekeeper. What would you say about the role of these agents? And how would you change it? OK, so the gate, the question is, and who are you and where are you from? My name is Pat Alper. I'm a budding author. <laughs> okay, Pat Alper is a budding author. She pointed to Chris when yeah. she asked the question. And she wants to know about the gatekeepers to the gatekeepers, the role of the agent. You're right. right. Well, in, in, in terms of literary agents, there uh, are um, just a very, very small handful of people of color who are, who are literary agents. It's, um, it's maybe even a, a less diverse group of people than in the editorial staff, and you're right, those are the gatekeepers, the gatekeepers. Most people don't get to an editor before, unless they've been, you know, unless an agent gets them there. Um, and uh, yes, and that's, so the, they play, um, a, a, you know, a definite role, and I think in terms of like that, you know, sort of complete, you know, that sort of uh, increasingly narrow, um, constricting tube that gets, you know, the writer to the public. Um, and there's still, you know, in terms of traditional publishing, there's still, a you know, very critical part of that, and uh, and definitely not a diverse group of people. Now, these two questions. Uh, oh, go ahead first. Change their role in some way. Well, as I said, one thing I do a lot of times is I don't wait for agents to send me things because if I do, then I'm waiting for agents to send me things. I'm not have getting. Uh, I'm having someone else sort of pre view things for me, which I don't, a person I don't necessarily trust, or a group of people I don't necessarily trust. Um, so I, a lot of times, try to go out and find writers on my own, um, and uh, which is a little bit more time consuming, a little bit more work, but uh, sometimes pays off. Um, so, you know, but that's, you know, it's hard to say that, you know, I mean, there's so many people who write, and there's so, uh, and even, even just relying on, on agents, there's too much stuff that comes in, um, and I turn down 90% of it. So you know when you widen that to the just anyone who sort of unsolicited sends you things, then it's just I think just it's overwhelming as a almost physically overwhelming. You know, so you answered my follow up, which is whether there was a connection that you can actually find more writers more easily now through blogs, through self publishing, absolutely. absolutely. We can all find more creative people more easily now, and I think they can also find us more easily now, sort of get to us. And I think it's also a question of thinking about who those gatekeepers are. I mean, in the art world, they tend to be gallerists, right? The people who represent artists. And often it means being an advocate with those very people about the values mm -hmm. that are important to you. So that at the Studio Museum, where we are constantly talking about the value of artists of African descent and having that conversation not only with our audiences who come to the museum for that knowledge, um, our members who support the museum and our donors for that way, but talking to the entire ecology right, of the art and cultural world so that these values become ones that they potentially can begin to take on. 
so that a gallerist might imagine that they widen their worldview through what we see as the kind of R&D as an institution that we are doing in our exhibitions, in our residency program, in our collection, in our publications, in our web presence, that then can impact those gatekeepers, um, not just for us, but again, for the entire. I'm going to take your question in just a minute, but I just wonder if, you have to, if we have to acknowledge something, that this takes time. That yeah. you know that you're not talking about you're talking maybe not in glacial terms, but it does take a lot of time, and you have to at some point. Um, one of your writers, Tanahasi, talks about doing the work and, and imagining imagining Sisyphus with a smile on his face. Right. That you have to just get up right. and do it over right. do and over again. Do the work every day. That's why I have to talk to myself walking in the building mm -hmm. every day. I still <laughs> talk to myself going down 125th Street every day because it's not just. I think all of us have had the experience. There's a version of our job, right, that other people not like us have, and it's a very different job. Right? There's someone, my, the artist who inspires me most, who also happens to be my closest friend, Glenn Ligon, often, you know, when I'm telling him something about my day, he'll insert the name of one of my museum director <coughs> colleagues and say, do you think that they have to do that? Mm -hmm. And I know that's not the case, but you know what? Here's the thing, I have already in my career seen the dividends of what the work, right, done with a huge amount of purpose can do. So in a way that, yes, it's with a smile on one face, but it's also with a sense of purpose of the change that's possible in doing the hard work. Tell us who you are and tell us your question. I'm Don Schwartz from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And as you've heard, we talk about building a culture of health in the country that very centrally thinks about equity and the issues of how we provide people with equitable opportunity to be healthy. I'm struck by the analogy of our thinking about those systems and contexts that provide gates for people to have access to things that are healthy and the gates that you're talking about for each of the different media that you represent. You have different voices and different experiences and I'm trying to get your frames. So for each of you, do you frame the gate in terms of cultural problems, in terms of prejudice as a problem, in terms of business and the economics as a, an issue with the gate? How, do you, how would you frame or how do you frame the gate? Great question. Thank you. Um, for me, the gate is economic. The problem is, is that um, the rational economic analysis that people should be doing when trying to assess value are, is distorted by centuries of misogyny and racism. Um, and so if you can remove that, then you can make rational economic, you can make effective, intelligent, and economic analyses, and you're not going to have those gatekeeping problems. But, you know, an overwhelmingly upper middle class white male industry is <coughs> touched significantly by misogyny and racism. Um, and so, you know, I actually consider a significant part of my work, in addition to sort of creating this marketplace and like talking about writers and celebrating writers, um, which by the way, there's an an economic analysis, a sort of missed economic analysis about the value of writers even vis-a-vis -vis directors and actors. But with this, as a subcategory, when you talk about women, when you talk about people of color, um, a lot of my work is about confronting that reality. Like, you say but you can't sell black people abroad. Where are the numbers? You show me the numbers and I'll back you 100%. And I literally, I've, I've asked every studio head, I asked every international sales agent, just give me one study. One study, and I will, I will post it on every social media platform as your excuse for making these calls. Nada. Because I can give you 100 counterexamples. Um, Big Mama's House 2 did like $75 million world internationally. Like, maybe not the best example, but if that can happen, <laughs> but if that can happen, what else can happen right, is my right. point. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. what else can happen? So for me, it, it's, it's, it's economics, but, but economic decisions are always you know, cast through a lens. Uh, of the rest of the culture, and, and that's where the problem comes. Thelma, what's your frame? Well, even in the nonprofit world, it's economic, but I think it's a combination of all the things you've said, and it also comes that art, museums, the art world, live in this world of privilege, where the sense of equity around decision making is often cast around being about certain values that while might present themselves as universal, are actually quite exclusive, and that exclusivity is part of the value of the world. So it is about breaking that down. And that's about notions of sort of power and decision making. And that's really what the frame is. Chris? Uh, yeah, for me, I think it's, uh, it is, a, as you said, a combination of all of those things. And I think part of it is thinking about what are the kind of metrics for success and how you can maybe rethink those to some degree. Like, I think for some books, 
um, the, you know, the metric is always going to be sales and how much money and revenue they generate. I think for other books, um, you know, I see them as opportunities to change the conversation in some way about something that's very important um, and to bring like some kind of new thinker or someone, if I'm working on fiction, someone who's bringing something that's stylistically new or revolutionary or whatever, like into the mix of um, book publishing. I think of that as my responsibility, like not so much making money for this publicly, you know, this sort of global, you know, conglomerate that I work for, but to change the culture in some small way, you know, by introducing new voices and new ideas. And I think that, I mean, if I'm going to be there, that's what I have to be there for, because anyone, you know, these other fill-in-the-blank names can make money for the company. And I hope I can make money for the company, too, but I feel like I also have to have a, a different set of metrics. And then sometimes it's, this, it's about cultivating the career of a writer. And you do one book because you know they can do another book, and you know they can grow and become something better. So it's like you know, trying to introduce important ideas, trying to cultivate um, artists and writers, um, and also making money. And then you know, it, it, the other part of it for me is also sort of changing the culture within the organizations, um, because uh, I think that's how you make it sustainable over time. So there's also a work you do inside the building. Um, Tell us who you are and tell us your question. Sure. My name is Howard Herring. I'm the president of the New World Symphony in Miami Beach. We're not a professional orchestra, although the name sounds like that. We're actually <laughs> a fellowship program, three-year fellowship, bringing players from conservatories and music schools into our three-year program, and then they go on to their professional mm. lives. We have been challenged by classical music field. Now, I know that in film and in museum and in literature, you guys have your challenges. Black classical musicians have equal or greater challenges. Mm -hmm. We've been asked by the field to think about a mentoring process, a mentoring program. We do it on our own, in our own city of Miami, in Miami Beach. We have that system down. We're formalizing it. We hope we're building a model that other, others could use. But my question is, is there anybody out there in your field who has created a mentoring structure that you can point to that would help me and help us move forward in Good that question. direction? Thank you. Um, uh, Are you looking specifically on the race front or just mentoring structure period that's been effective in developing talent? I'm, I'm speaking on the race, race front. front. Yeah. Okay. Talented musicians of color yeah. who are not currently making the move through the transition period. Yeah. Um, I don't have an example. Um, that I can point to you specifically in the art museum world. We have a lot of great initiatives and programs that are looking at issues of the pipeline, of training or mentoring, right, that are in process and haven't scaled. But there are some examples from other fields that I can talk to you about later that we've been looking at in the art and museum world um, because they have been over time, a 10 or 20 year period, able to make an impact in other fields because this is sort of key and critical, right, in the classical music space, in the visual arts space, literature space, this idea that, you know, to begin to talk about this means we have to have models that not only create a pipeline, but create the possibility for success. I would also look at uh, Sundance and the Sundance Labs, Labs program. Mm -hmm. um, I think when Michelle, like, there's no, they, they've done a lot of sort of specifically diversity related uh, development work, but baked into the program, and a lot of this I think is credit to Michelle Satter who runs the Sundance Institute. Like, if you look at, there's a generation of young black filmmakers that, you know, some names you know, Ava DuVernay, Ryan Coogler, and some names that you don't yet but will very soon. And I think almost every single one of them has come through that pipeline in some capacity. Um, so again, I don't know that it's like, they're not saying, hey, Sundance is focusing on developing black filmmakers. They're saying, hey, Sundance is focusing on developing great young filmmakers and we know they're out there, so we're going to make the extra effort to find them and then make sure that they're developed and, take, and, and protected. Um, and the results, I mean, that I've seen have been pretty strong. And if anyone else has ideas, find out at the end of the day to pass, yeah. pass, <laughs> that, pass that on. Um, we unfortunately have to, have to wrap. Um, I would, B, go ahead. I, I just have a question, uh, or maybe uh, a recommendation. You didn't have anyone from the theater. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. if you have something like this next year, I hope that you would bring someone by the name of Brandon J. 
Jacob. Of course. Jacob. Yeah. Yes, we would love Certainly. that. <laughs> Thank you. That's Ambassador B. Welters who was suggesting that if we do yeah. this okay. next year, that we <laughs> should bring a very specific point Brandon taken. Jacob. Jacob. Point well taken. Yes, yep. his, his play was this year and has three productions on Broadway right now. He is, as they say, all that and a bag of chips. Yeah. So, um, so thank you bags. very, very much. I just want to make one point before we go. You heard all of them talk about the extracurricular work that they do beyond their job titles to mentor young people, to make sure that those gates are open and open wide. And so I invite all of you to think about the gatekeepers that you know in your own space, because while they are helping others, they could too benefit from um, just an attaboy or an attagirl, um, from, assistant, from assistance or acknowledgement of the work that they do. It is important work, and, um, and, and they could use a little bit of that as well. Chris, Thelma, thank you, thank you very, very much.